Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may join us today. I am Thomas Paschke, Application Support Specialist at TA Instruments, and I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining today's webinar. In case you should have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the Q&A window. We will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. Frieda Dreisbach, Product Manager for the Dilatometry and Rubotherm products at TA Instruments. After obtaining his PhD in Chemical Engineering in 1998, he started his career in a sales management, man, management position at Rubotherm in Germany. Since 2003, he was Managing Director of Rubotherm until the company was acquired by TA in 2016. Frieda's research interests are in material characterization at high pressures and high temperatures. He published more than 30 papers in peer-reviewed journals. Being active in scientific societies, he became an elected fellow of the International Adsorption Society, and in Germany, he acts as vice chair of the Adsorption Working Group and is board, of member, and is board member of the High Pressure Technology Working Group. The title of Frieda's presentation today is Melt Viscosity Measurements at High Temperatures. Maintaining the optimum viscosity of a molten material is key for efficiency and product quality of many industrial processes. Processing of melts at high temperatures is the basis for classical or additive manufacturing of many materials like glasses or metals. Molten slag or ash viscosity is essential for economically operating industrial gasification processes of coal, biomass or waste. TA Instruments new VIS-413 high temperature viscometer provides dependable viscosity data of melts in an industry leading wide temperature range. The webinar will introduce the measuring principle of the VIS-413, the important features and benefits will be showcased by results of high temperature viscosity measurements performed on a variety of different materials. See how high temperature viscosimet viscosimetry can provide you with the right material data critical to improve melt processing in classical and additive manufacturing. And with this, I pass it on to, on to Frida. Frida, the screen is yours. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. Hello and welcome to today's webinar about melt viscosity measurements at high temperatures using a rotational viscometer. Here is an outline of the presentation today. In a short introduction to the topic viscosity and rotational viscometer, I will also show you for which materials melt viscosity measurements at high temperatures are of economic and industrial importance. In the second part of this presentation, I will present the new rotational viscometer VIS-413, describe the setup and the measuring principle. <clears throat> In the last part of the presentation, I want to show some data which we have generated with the new instrument on these industrially relevant materials for which viscosity temperature relationship is important. And finally, I will wrap up the presentation in a conclusion. The viscosity of a fluid describes the internal friction or the internal resistance of being deformed. A macroscopic model of this, in fact, molecular effect is shown on the top right of this slide. Here we assume the fluid to be present in distinct layers. We have a lower layer and one layer on top. And if we want to move the upper layer uh, relative to the lower layer, we need to apply a force. This force, which we need to apply to induce a movement relative to the unit area, is so-called shear stress. The movement which we in induce by this force is the so-called shear rate. And the ratio of this two, the shear stress divided by the shear rate, is the fluid property viscosity. It is the resistance against being deformed. This is shown in the yeah, working equation in the blue box. Shear stress divided by the shear rate is the viscosity of the fluid. If we want to assess the viscosity of a fluid experimentally, we have two possibilities. We can control the shear stress and measure the resulting shear rate. 
or go the other way around. We control the shear rate and measure the resulting shear stress to assess the viscosity. And this is the ways, or these are the ways in which a viscometer can work. In a rotational viscometer, what is the topic of our presentation today, we take our two layers of our model idea, put them upright, and wind them in a cylindrical form. And then we have the flow pattern of a rotational viscometer. The schematics of a rotational viscometer is shown here to the right. It always consists of a cylindrical cup in which the fluid is contained. In the cylindrical cup, we have a smaller, also cylindrical bob. In order to induce a relative movement of the fluid layers, if you want, to each other, we have either to turn the outer cup while the, while the bob in the center is standing still, or we keep the cup standing still and rotate the center bob. This is experimentally easier to make, uh, to realize. So most rotational viscometers work in this way. It's a seal type. The cup is standing still while the rotor in the center is turning with a rotational speed. The equations on the right side next to, on this slide on the right side next to the um, picture of the rotational viscometer describe the shear stress and the shear rate as a function of the measure torque M in this uh, equations, and the measured angular velocity omega in this uh, equations. All other quantities are geometrical quantities, the radii of the bob and the radius of the cup and the length of the bob, which is immersed into the fluid. If we introduce all these <coughs> quantities in our working equation for the viscosity, we come to the equation shown in the in the blue box on this slide, the viscosity is uh, instrument specific constant, which basically uh, depends only on geometrical considerations, radii and length of the rotor, times the torque, which is needed to realize a rotation divided by the angular velocity of this rotation. In our rotational viscometer, we control the angular velocity and measure the torque. And the instrument specific constant in this equation can in principle be determined from the geometrical uh, uh, sizes of the, of the instrument, but practically it is determined by a measurement with a reference fluid of known viscosity. If the viscosity, the left side of our equation is known, if we measure the torque M, if we control the angular vis viscosity omega, we have all the quantities of this equation except the instrument specific constant K. So with a reference measurement, with reference fluid, we can, we can determine the instrument specific constant K and use this then later for measurements with unknown fluids. <clears throat> Here on this slide, I show you some materials for which uh, viscosity temperature relationship measurements are really important for manufacturing of goods of the materials. Number one is glass industry. Glass is always a process where we start from a mold glass and then uh, shape it. We cast it into a flat form or we cast it into some bars and then further process it while it still is hot and soft. And this hot and soft <clears throat> is exactly what we measure in a rotational viscometer. So we can measure the relationship between the viscosity, the softness of the material, and the temperature. And this is what glass manufacturers need to know for certain glasses. They need to know at which temperature does my glass of this and this composition or of this and this shape have a certain viscosity which allows to, for instance, draw glass fiber, which allows to blow the glass, which allows to bend the glass into a certain shape. In metal industry, metals all come from the liquid phase. All metal processing starts with a liquid metal, which is then casted in a traditional way or in a continuous casting process into some uh, preliminary products, which are then further uh, worked on for making the final products. Another way is additive manufacturing. In additive manufacturing, the parts are already made in complex geometries by partly melting metal, for instance, with a laser beam. And this partly melted metal also has then to wet the surface of the already existing metal part. So here the viscosity temperature relationship is also very important. Ash and slag, as another example, is important for uh, solid fired 
boilers or gasification units. Solid fire means it can be coal as a fuel, it can be biomass as a fuel, but it can also be waste as a fuel. Uh, in circular economy, one way to use the molecular uh, content, yeah, the, 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 the chemical um, species of a waste is to gasify this waste. This is a kind of pyrolysis process of waste, not burning, but pyrolyzing. And then we gen then <clears throat> from this waste, a useful gas is generated, which is then further refined into new food fuels or feedstock for chemical engineering. In all these processes, uh, ash is fed into the gasifier or into the boiler, and this ash has to be removed in the high temperature process. It converts into a molten slag, and the slag has to flow down in the boiler to be extracted. And these flow properties have to be measured experimentally. Finally, geological materials, I mean minerals and stone here, are the, the real <clears throat> classical natural material, the magma and lava. So volcano research and prediction of eruptions and transport of magma and lava in the, uh, in the ground is only possible by knowing the viscosity temperature relationship of these complex mixtures. Since it's such a complex composition, it cannot be predicted. It has to be measured on model substances or on the real magma. And finally, for industrial applications, we have uh, mineral wool, which is used for uh, thermal insulation of buildings, which is generated from molten stone in the melt spinning process. And this melt spinning process, the efficiency of the melt spinning process and the fiber uh, product which we make depends on the viscosity of this molten material. Our new high temperature viscometer, VIS413, is not coming out of the blue. TA Instruments has acquired over the years some smaller companies who have made over the last decades already high temperature viscometers. And based on these experiences and based on hundreds of yeah, customer installations and the feedback of customers we got and the experience we had with their applications, we were able to design the new VIS413 with features which really provide added benefit for the customer. And really in the best sense here, we combined forces. So TA is the market leader in rheology. Here is the know-how for viscosity, for accurate viscosity measurement. Then we have the company Bayer Thermoanalyse, which is a German company since 2012, a part of TA instrument. Bayer was producing high temperature uh, dilatometers and also high temperature rotational viscometers for 20 years already before it became a part of TA instruments. Here we have a really extensive knowledge about excellent high temperature furnaces, compact, uh, long lasting, reliable high temperature furnace and high temperature technology. And finally, we have the company Theta Industries, a US company, which is a part of TA Instruments since 2017. And this company was specialized in high temperature rotational viscometers for applications where the sample is oxygen sensitive. They had a vacuum viscometer, which was unique in the market at that time. And by combining our experience, combining the knowledge of the teams which are still on board and designing a new instrument, we were able to combine all these features into one great new rotational viscometer, which I will describe in the next slides. Rotational viscometry in, for high temperatures for melts is also guided by some industrial uh, standards, international industrial standards. Some are listed here on the bottom of this slide. And the viscometer we have, of course, follows uh, or conf uh, complies to all of these standards and the regulations which are given in there and the design uh, ideas which are given in there. So what is our instrument. We have a seal type viscosimeter. It consists of three main parts. On top of the instrument, we have the viscometer sensor. This is basically a EC motor providing the control of the rotational speed of the cylindrical bob in the fluid. The control of speed is very important, so we need to measure the position, the rotational speed with a high resolution. And in our instrument, we apply a optical encoder for this purpose and have a C motor, which is really almost free of any uh, type of um, internal friction. Then we have the sample cup and the rotor system. Here we apply technology which was developed by Teta Industries. It's easy to load sample cup 
and the cup and bob can be used from different can be made from different materials it's easy to exchange a cup and bob also the geometries of the of the cylindrical rotor can be changed can be adapted to low viscosity uh, fluids or to high viscosity fluids by changing the diameter of the rotor and then we have, of course, the furnace, since we have a high temperature viscometer, high temperature furnace uh, shown here. This is uh, based on decades of experience uh, in building reliable high temperature furnaces. And a special feature here, it is water cooled, so it's a very compact and highly dynamic furnace. The whole instrument, the pictures are shown in the center uh, of, the, of the slide, has a compact footprint. Uh, in the left picture, we see the furnace in the open position, in the lower position, where sample loading and removing of the uh, of the sample cup after the measurement uh, is is performed. So as access to the sample is granted by driving down the furnace. The right picture shows the furnace in measuring position. It is driven up and heating the sample in the furnace. And the picture to the far right is a beauty picture, which we shot after heating the sample crucible and the rotor and then lowered the furnace to see how it glows in there because optically this is when the furnace is closed, not the access. So going a little bit more specific into the parts of the instrument. So we have, as I said, a viscosity sensor on top, which is the EC motor. And a special um, feature which we built into the new viscometer is that this part of the instrument can be purged. In a thermal instrument, in a viscometer, also in a TGA and other thermal instruments, the sample is heated to a high temperature. And some sample materials have volatile components which are evaporating from a sample during this heating. And what we want to avoid with this purge of the sensor area is that the vapor goes up into our sensor, viscosity sensor, and then deposits, for instance, on the optical encoder or on the parts of the EC motor and um, um, gives some contamination in the sensor area. For this reason, we can equip the uh, high temperature viscometer with a gas supply module providing a continuous purge gas flow from the top, purging the viscometer sensor, preventing vapor to go up and allowing us to measure also with samples having volatile components in there. The whole viscometer with FOS13 is always vacuum and gas tight. As soon as the furnace is closed, we have a vacuum tight. Um, separation from the internal sample cell and the outside and vacuum can be pulled with an uh, accessory uh, and we can also purge the inner volume with an inert or an active reference gas providing oxygen and humidity free environments for the samples. The high temperature furnace covering really the widest temperature range of all rotational viscometers in industry is water cooled. By the water cooling, we could realize a compact footprint, which is shown as one more feature here of the whole instrument. We don't need a big isolation, but moreover, the furnace is really highly dynamic. So we can high, have high heating rates, which is important to start a measurement at high temperatures, but we can also realize very high cooling rates compared to other instruments. The high temperature temperature viscometer with FOS13 cools down in two to two and a half hours, depending on the starting temperature to room temperature. So after a measurement is completed, two hours later, a new measurement can be started. And this is industry leading. So we can run several samples a day, which is not possible in any other high temperature rotation of this computer. And finally, I mentioned it already, we have Easy sim sample loading by a spring-loaded fixture uh, kept in place by basically friction between the fixtures and, and the sample crucible. So it's easy to load. It can uh, sample can be loaded in glove box or in a ventilated hood if oxygen or humidity sensitive samples should be used. The water cooling of the furnace provides us this fast cool down, the higher productivity, and it allows us to cover a really high temperature range. We have two furnace configurations, one up to 1550 sample temperature and the other one up to 1750 sample temperature. This is the highest temperature available in all commercial uh, rotational viscometers. In addition to providing the dynamic furnace for cooling down, it is really safe. All the outer surfaces are really cold and can be touched even at the highest sample temperature. And in addition, the water cooling is also used to cool the base plate of our viscosity sensor and provides a good isothermal condition for our sensor. That means we don't have any drift or inaccuracy 
depending on the sample temperature which we run because the viscosity sensor always has an isothermal environment. The reactive feature, reactive gas feature, a purge gas feature and vacuum feature are really unique features of the WISP-413. The WISP-413 can be equipped with accessory gas supply module and a vacuum pump if the sample material requires this. If the sample is loaded and the furnace is closed, we have a vacuum tight instrument and then a vacuum pump can be applied to remove all air and humidity or whatever gas might have been in the instrument due to sample loading prior to the measurement, prior to heating the sample. So it really can have a fast removal of all oxygen in there and humidity. And then with the gas supply module, you can have an inert purge to ensure oxygen free environment. Some sample materials like metals, for instance, or the organic materials, the, the coal ash or the coal slag or the biomass slag, require even more oxygen-free atmosphere or to mimic the real process conditions are measured in different active gases. For this purpose, we have two gas connections. So we can purge the viscometer sensor, as mentioned before, by an inert gas to prevent uh, deposit of vapor uh, coming from the sample in this area. And we can separately purge the sample area with a, a reactive gas. Reactive gas for the samples we uh, are showing here, we are considering here, are mixtures of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide for the, for the slag, for the ash or so-called forming gas, a mixture of hydrogen and nitrogen for metals. And these two are both reducing gases, providing really a 100% oxygen-free environment for the sample material. And this is truly unique amongst all the high temperature viscometers. The sample loading, the sample cup and the bob are simple geometries. You see it on the left of this slide, uh, the sample rotor, uh, the, the, the bob in the parking position above the sample crucible, which is uh, located lower. The three long rods uh, hold the sample crucible in the position and one of these rods is movable, so it can be spring loaded, it can be moved apart and then the sample crucible can be easily uh, loaded or unloaded. We will show this in a short video on the next slide. These simple geometries of rotor and cup can, of course, be made from different materials. As standard materials, we offer here uh, alumina, alumina oxide, so ceramics, or platinum parts. Platinum is preferred in glass industry and for glassy samples, while alumina oxide provides better chemical stability for organic samples, for instance. The ceramic parts are intended to be deposited after a measurement. So after a measurement, the melt sits in the crucible and either has to be removed for the next measurement, if the same crucible should be uh, uh, used again, or the crucible is deposited, which is the case for the, for the uh, alumina crucibles. In platinum, the crucible, the material is more expensive. They are typically cleaned by a heat treatment after the measurement. The rotor diameter, finally, can be selected according to the viscosity of the fluid. So for highly viscous fluids, we use a small rotor to have a lower torque. And for low viscosity fluids, we can use larger rotor diameters to have a higher torque, so more, less fluid to move in the, in the instrument. Other materials than the two shown here, at the platinum and the alumina, uh, can be offered on the basis of a non-standard request. If your sample material requires other materials than platinum or alumina, we can consider, for instance, depending on the temperature, I fuse silica or graphite as materials for these parts. Here in this slide, I want to show you how easy it is, how simple it is to load the sample. This is really uh, done, uh, realized on purpose since some sample materials for high temperature melt viscosity measurements like salts, for instance, require loading in a glove box in a humidity free and oxygen free environment. These two pictures here, the left one shows the VIS 413 in sample loading position. So the furnace is in the lower position and the sample crucible and the rotor can be accessed in this position. And the right uh, picture shows the instrument in measuring position when the furnace is closed. I will now start a video showing you how easy and simple it is to insert a crucible with the sample into the holding rods. 
See, this is the starting point holding rods without crucible. And now this one is movable. The crucible is set in. We have an anti-twist device, which prevents the crucible from being twisted. And just by this movable uh, uh, holder fixture, the crucible is held in place. This is all which has to be done for sample loading. Now the furnace can be lifted into the measuring position. This is an electrical lift by just pushing a button on the front of the instrument. And then the measurement can start with, if necessary, evacuation of the gas in the sample volume and purging, or otherwise just simply by heating. And this is shown here on this slide. This is the measuring principle, starting from the left, where the sample uh, uh, crucible with the sample is loaded, as shown in the video before. Then the furnace is lifted electrically, shown in the second picture from the left. And then we have the complete isolation. From this time on, we can evacuate, we can remove the air, and we can purge the inner volume. So we can purge already, we can provide an oxygen-free atmosphere before we start heating, which is the third picture in the center. Then we start heating the sample. Uh, and the sample is melting, uh, um, which is the fourth picture, where the sample is molten. Then the rotor is lowered from the top into the molten sample. And finally, the right picture, the measurement can start by controlling the rotational speed and measuring the torque, which is required for that. We have two different uh, controlling principles of rotational speed and measuring the torque. The, the simple one is an isothermal segment where we keep the temperature of the sample uh, constant and then control the rotational speed of the rotor at different levels. So we can start with high rotation speed, 300, 400 RPM, and then go down in steps uh, to lower rotational speeds. This measuring principle provides information about the nature of the fluid. If it is a Newtonian fluid, then the change in shear rate, which is actually the, the, the different uh, rotational speeds, it's a change in shear rate, should not provide a change in the measured viscosity, since in a Newtonian fluid, the viscosity is independent from the shear rate. If we find based on the shear rate different viscosity values, then this is an indication that we have a non-Newtonian fluid. And then we continue this measurement at different temperatures and measure the shear rate dependent viscosity at different temperatures of this fluid. Another principle which is shown here in this slide, it's a little busy diagram I will walk you through, is a continuous measurement of Newtonian fluids over a huge range of viscosity. So we're going to cover a big, big range of viscosity measurements. So in this slide, we plot over the time different measured and controlled values. So the red line as a beginning here is the temperature of the cell. We start at the highest temperature and then have a linear cooling rate. In this case, it's a 5 Kelvin per minute cooling rate, continuous cooling of the cell. Then we control the rotational speed of our rotor. And we start, this is the green line here, with 200 RPM. At this 200 RPM constant uh, rotational speed, we measure at the highest temperature a torque of about 1.5 millinewton meter, which is the blue line in the diagram. With cooling the sample, continuously cooling the sample, the viscosity of the sample increases, it gets stiffer if you want. And so the torque which is required uh, increases also. To, so we keep the rotational speed constant. The torque required for this rotational speed is increasing. This is the blue line it's going up. Every instrument, every measuring instrument, and also every rotational viscometer has a certain range in which it can measure the quantities, in our case, the torque. Uh, and if we exceed this range, or if we go too much to the borders of the measuring range, then measuring gets inaccurate. Therefore, we decided here in this example, this is set in the software, for a threshold of 50 millinewton meters. So we don't want to exceed the 50 millinewton meters in torque. This has some uh, other reasons. It has the, the measuring range reason. It also has the reason that in these high temperatures, we might be twisting the, uh, the rotor if we apply higher torque. Yeah? So the 50 millinewton meters is set for our instrument as a good range. If we approach this, the measurement basically at this rotational speed is at an end. We cannot continue. We cannot go to higher torque. So what we do then, since we want to continue the measurement for lower, uh, for, for higher viscosities, excuse me, and at lower temperatures, we then reduce the rotational speed stepwise. So we go from 200 RPM to 50 RPM. 
So we reduce uh, the rotational speed, we reduce the, the shear stress, and by this, automatically also the torque which is required to maintain the slower rotation is dropping. The blue line drops. And then we can continue to measure with a cooling sample, increasing viscosity, increasing torque. When we again approach the 50 millinewton meter, we switch to 10 RPM. Again, the torque required for 10 RPM drops, and we can continue the measurement with increasing viscosity, decreasing temperature, and increasing torque until we reach it again. And this stepwise process is continued until 0.001 RPM, this is the lowest uh, rotational speed we can control. From the, the, the uh, rotational speed, from our angular velocity, which we control, and the torque, which we measure during the measurement, and the form factor, which was um, <coughs> determined by calibration measurements with reference fluid, we can then determine the <coughs> me, viscosity of the fluid, which is finally the black line. This is what we want to measure. And please note that this black line is referring to far right axis. This is a logarithmic axis. So we cover values from 2.5 up to 8.5 on a logarithmic scale. This is six orders of magnitude in viscosity. Yeah? So we are going from 10 to 10 to the power of seven in viscosity in one measurement. And this is only possible because we change the rotational speed. This working principle of the rotational viscometer with changed rotational speed, of course, is only possible for Newtonian fluids. Otherwise, the viscosity would not be a steady curve in here. And as I said, for non-Newtonian fluids, we have the different working principle isothermal, changing the rotational speed to measure the shear rate dependent viscosity. So reference fluids and calibration measurement are already mentioned. Uh, a number of different um, silicon and mineral oils are available with different molecular weights and different viscosities <coughs> as <coughs> reference fluids for, for rotational viscometers. <coughs> these provide us, <coughs> excuse me, these provide a known viscosity. So this can be used to determine the instrument specific factor K. Well, if we do this calibration or reference measurement at ambient temperatures, is this still valid at high temperatures? For that reason, we have used uh, reference glasses, which have uh, certified viscosity values in the molten states at high temperatures. And this is what we show here in this diagram. So we compared here the measured and the uh, uh, certified values of the viscosity for a reference glass coming from the Deutsche Glas Technische Gesellschaft. It's a certified uh, viscosity standard at high temperatures. So we measured at 12, 13, and 1400 degrees C. And you see that the deviation between literature value, literature value means the certified value, and the experimentally measured value is very low. So this provides that the calibration with the reference fluids at low temperatures can be applied at high temperatures for the measurement. Now coming to our application examples. We're starting with glass here. As mentioned in the introduction, glass manufacturers need to know at which temperature a certain glass of a certain composition has a certain uh, viscosity value which allows to form it, to shape it. Uh, um, in the diagram to the right, uh, the red dotted line is a schematic picture of the temperature x-axis y-axis is viscosity, viscosity relationship. And you see certain points on here. At the highest temperature, we have the lowest viscosity. This is the glass melt. And then going to lower temperatures, we reach the working point, which is a log viscosity 2.5, the flow point, which is log viscosity 3.5, or the softening point, which is log viscosity 6.5 or 7. <clears throat> and these points, these distinct viscosity values, the so-called forming range. And for a certain glass composition, for a certain yeah, glass type, the temperature at which it reaches this viscosity needs to be known to shape, to form a glass for industrial manufacturing of glass products. And this can be quite different for different glasses. Here in this example, we have measured three different glass compositions, and we see that the viscosity temperature relationship is drastically different. If we concentrate on the log viscosity 2.5 uh, point, then the red 
glass reaches this viscosity at a little less than 1100 degrees C. The blue glass at a little less than 1300 degrees C, while the black glass only at 1500 degrees C. So it's really important to know the viscosity temperature relationship for a certain composition of glass. It's not only different glasses, which are on purpose different, but also the natural ingredients used in glass, quartz and sand and other ingredients change because this is natural material. The composition change from batch to batch. And so the temperature viscosity relationship of a glass also changes from batch to batch. This is why our glass customer typically uh, run a viscosity measurement at least every week for their batches to find out at which temperature this batch has the viscosity to be shaped and formed into glass fibers, into glass tubes or whatever this uh, glass manufacturer is manufacturing really important quantity for process control and producing proper glass material. But it's not only the composition of the glass, it's not only different glasses, also the same glass, the same coming from the same batch, can have different viscosities if it is pre-produced in different shapes. Here in this uh, um, example, we compare the viscosity temperature relationship for the same glass provided in different shapes. So the black curve is for this glass provided in glass powder, fine particles. The blue curve is for the same glass provided in glass chips, bigger particles, breakouts. And then finally, the green curve is for a glass yarn. It's a glass fiber, fine fiber. All of these materials were supplied to us, same glass. We filled them, one each, in a sample crucible, melted it so that we, we are measuring really the melt viscosity of the same glass just coming from different raw materials. And we can see that the, the viscosity values differ. So that means if, if a raw material, uh, if a different raw material is used in a glass melting process to produce parts, it might be necessary to adjust the temperature of the processing accordingly to the, to the raw material. This is not predictable, this has to be measured. So for these raw materials used in glass manufacturing, uh, the temperature viscosity relationship has to be measured. And this has a big commercial impact. Imagine these many glass parts which are made and consumed worldwide and glass manufacturers are everywhere. So all of these glass manufacturers basically rely in their manufacturing on this viscosity temperature relationship. My next examples are coming from the glass, uh, from the metal industry, excuse me. Um, metals are produced from the liquid phase typically from the melt yeah, in the traditional casting process, in a continuous casting process shown to the, to the right, or in the additive manufacturing process shown here on the left, uh, the, the left picture with this complex geometry um, is, a, is a coming from a powder additive manufacturing process. Here, a metal part <clears throat> is designed in a complex geometry by selective laser welding. So a layer of metal powder is put on the already existing metal part, and then a part of this powder is molten to um, really get into connection, into a, a, a solid state connection with the already existing metal part. And the flow properties of this metal powder molten by the laser need to be such that it's really wetting the metal part and filling all the voids and giving a defect free uh, material. We are currently undergoing uh, a testing with a high nickel alloy, uh, so called super alloy for additive manufacturing. So we are measuring the viscosity temperature relationship of this metal powder being melted at high temperatures. Unfortunately, I cannot show the example here because this is still uh, in, in discussion with the, with the user and I cannot disclose this uh, data here. Also in welding and in uh, classical casting process, the flow properties of the molten metal play an important role. So these need to be known and for new metals, <clears throat> for super alloys, and if they are supplied in the powder form, remember the example I showed before for the, for the glass, so powders can have different flow properties than uh, melting coming from the, from the bulk material. 
On the right side here, we have uh, mold powders. We have mentioned mold powders for continuous casting. Mold powders are used in a continuous casting process to protect the liquid metal and the hot metal against oxidation. So it's a protective layer, but they are also melting in contact with the hot metal and providing lubrification when the metal is flowing through the cooled mold and continuously this uh, is extracted out of this mold, which is shown on the picture there. So we have a liquid metal, which is then flowing to cooled molds. And at the end, we have solid strands coming out. And, and the mold powder provides the lubrification between the mold and the metal strand. And these mold powders properties are really interesting. And they need to be, yeah, these properties need to be adjusted for the metal, which should be produced in the continuous casting process. Here in this diagram, we show a um, relatively typical curve for a mold powder viscosity temperature relationship. Starting from the highest temperature, we have a continuous development in viscosity, low viscosities. At a certain distinct temperature, in this case, 1159.6 degrees C, we have a partial crystallization. Only part of the mixture uh, crystal crystallize and form crystals in the other remaining liquid. By this partly crystallization, of course, the composition of the remaining liquid is, <clears throat> is changed because this material, which is uh, crystallized, is not no longer present in the in the liquid. And the remaining liquid shows then a different viscosity. This is shown like in a step step size. Uh, shaped um, um, profile here. And then we again have a blue line at lower temperatures where we have a viscosity development of this temperature. So the step is partly crystallization and the blue line at lower temperatures of the step is the viscosity of the remaining liquid. And this is the important point. This crystallization, <clears throat> partly crystallization is wanted because these crystals, crystals in the melt provide a better heat conductivity. And in this continuous casting process, the heat from the liquid steel has to be uh, extracted into the cooled mold to provide a solid shell of the strand which is produced. So we need a good heat extraction. We need these crystals. But at the same time, we still need lubrification, which is depending on the viscosity. So the remaining liquid left of this crystallization step has to be low viscous enough to provide lubrification between the mold and the metal. And this has to be adjusted by compositional changes for these materials to the metal which is used in this casting process. If it is a higher temperature, it, the, the step of crystallization has to be at higher temperatures. If it is lower temperature material, the step of crystallization has to be at lower temperatures. In addition to testing new materials, the properties of new materials and formulating these new casting powders, it is also possible to remelt used casting powder. As I said, the casting powder provides uh, protection against oxidation and also picks up some um, uh, constituents of the liquid metal so that the composition of the casting powder during this process when it goes through the process is continuously changing and in order to assess how much this changes the crystallization properties crystallization temperature and viscosity properties a used casting powder which is present as slag after the process <clears throat> can be melted again in the rotational viscometer to check the influence which the metal and the interaction with air and oxygen had on this material and for this it's really important that we have this protective gas atmosphere capability so here we can measure in a reducing or an inert gas atmosphere that the used Casting powder is not oxidizing more than it was already before the measurement. Another example from energy industry this time is the coal slag and ash, not only coal biomass and also waste producing slag and ash. And as shown in the picture on the right side, this is an inert material. It's just melting in the burning or gasification process and has to be extracted from the boiler. So it flows down usually the inner lining of the boiler and is extracted at the bottom of this boiler. For this flow, we need a low viscosity, but at the same time, the viscosity should not be too low that it's like flowing too fast, which would cause erosion on the boiler. And here we have an example of uh, the same coal ash, but added some, with some fluxing agent limestone. Um, the operators of these coal-fired uh, power plants or gasifiers, they add limestone to the coal, 
which is then reducing the viscosity of the slag of the coal ash. And we see here the comparison about coal, uh, between coal ash without fluxing agent, our green curve, and the blue curve is 2% fluxing agent, 2% limestone in the coal uh, added before the firing. And then it's reduced that the coal ash uh, viscosity is reduced drastically to lower temperatures. This helps to let the ash flow down in the boiler. If we add 2% more limestone, the change is not that big. So the first 2% make a bigger, bigger change than the second uh, added 2% of limestone in the coal. And this is exactly the information the operators of gasifiers and coal-fired power plants need, because uh, they want to avoid to add too much fluxing agent, which is just you know, a waste of money. And, and uh, this is an inert material which needs to be heated. So it's not good for the efficiency of the process. It is important to have exactly this amount of uh, fluxing agent added, which is required. And depending on the source of the coal, depending on the batch of the coal, the coal ash uh, viscosity is changing. So this measurement has to be repeated basically for every different fuel which is used, which makes it even more evident uh, if you think about um, municipal waste incineration or gasification, where the fuel uh, is really a variety of different materials and unpredictable. It's good to have this information. Last example uh, examples for today are geological materials. I mentioned lava and magma as a complex mixture of different minerals and metals cannot be predicted the viscosity depending on temperature. It has to be measured on model substances or on the real magma. Uh, here it also uh, is required sometimes if you think about underground magma flows that a measurement is performed in an inert atmosphere because underground we don't have oxy oxygen and no uh, oxidize, oxidation of the metals, for instance, in the minerals. An industrial application example is shown at the bottom of this slide. This is the generation of fibers for mineral wool, which is used for thermal insulation of buildings. And these fibers, the stone fibers, are generated from a melt. So a, a mixture of different stones is uh, melted. And then it is uh, the liquid uh, melt is then dropped onto a fast spinning wheel. And with this melt spinning process, the thin fibers are generated. And the fiber diameter, length, geometry, and quality depends on the viscosity of the melt, which is flowing onto this fast spinning wheel, which again depends on the composition of the stone mixture prepared. So here again, we have the need for experimental measurement for different stone mixtures to make sure that we have the viscosity in the process which we need for the quality of the product. And here, this is an example. Uh, of a mineral uh, mixture, which was provided actually by one of the producers of this thermal insulation material. So we measured at relatively high temperatures, a low viscosity. We found between almost 1,500 degrees C and 1,200 degrees C, an increase of viscosity from 8 decipascal times second up to 125 decipascal per second. Which viscosity is exactly the right one for the melt spinning process, this is of course the know-how of the uh, of the producer of the insulation material, and they will know which viscosity is the right one. And then from this experimental curve, they can extract at which temperature they need to heat their melt and keep their melt to have a good running melt spinning process and produce good mineral fibers. My last example for today is uh, magmas, two different composition magmas. It's a model magma. It's mixed from different minerals and metals to be an analog for basalt magma. And uh, the problem with magmas is the same as we uh, as we found in the mold powder. A magma consists of, of a variety of a different variety of uh, materials, different minerals, different metals. And when it undergoes a cooling process, partly it partly crystallizes. And the viscosity of the remaining liquid is then, of course, changing in an unpredictable way because this element, which is already crystallized, is missing in the, in the liquid. So here, the only way to, to, to model magma flows, to model eruption of volcanoes, is to measure analogs or real magmas, the viscosity temperature relationship, since temperature is easier accessible. So temperature measurements can be performed easily in the ground in a volcano, not easily, but easier than viscosity measurements. 
And uh, if we know the temperature viscosity relationship, then one can, you know, find out what is the viscosity of the magma under these geological conditions underground or in the volcano. With that, I'm coming to my conclusion. I hope I could show you during my presentation that based on the, on the vast experience we have in building high temperature rotational viscometers and based on the on the yeah, different know-hows which we could combine coming from the groups, from the companies which are now under the head of TA instruments, we were able to really build a versatile and easy to use rotational viscosimeter for high temperature measurements. There are many other materials uh, where the high temperature viscosity temperature relationship is important, which I could not show here. So we are working currently on salts, molten salts, for instance, which are considered to be heat transfer fluid for new energy, nuclear and solar energy uh, generation processes. Um, glass is, of course, the main application, but metals are also coming more and more for metal additive manufacturing for the selective laser welting and also sintering processes that viscosity really plays a big role. So there are many more materials which I could not cover here. But we are sure that our instrument with the versatile um, configuration and with all these advantages of the controlled uh, en uh, environmental conditions, the vacuum conditions, the reactive gas conditions, the small footprint to be able to place it into a glove box, provides all the features which are needed for yeah, most of the sample materials and measurement requirements. We can adapt the measuring geometries, we can adapt the rotational speed to be able to measure low viscosity and high viscosity fluids. We have the controlling principle allowing to measure over an extremely wide range, six orders, seven orders of magnitude in viscosity. And we have the water cooled furnaces which make it very safe, easy to operate and have the small footprint and in addition also increase the productivity. So we think we are in a very good position here based on our experience, which we have, and uh, we hope that I could show, I hope that I could show you some of this in my presentation. Finally, on my last slide, I would like to draw your attention on some other uh, high temperature analyzers TA instrument is having in its portfolio. Um, TA instrument provides other thermal analyzers for thermophysical property measurement at high temperature. So we have a simultaneously thermal analyzer, which is a combined, combined TGA DSC, so measuring the weight change and also uh, enthalpy of reaction or melting, solidifying crystallization processes. So we get a combined weight and a heat curve out of this instrument up to 1,500 degrees C. We have laser flash analyzers for measuring temperature diffusivity and thermal conductivity in the temperature range even up to 2800 degrees C. And finally, we have mechanical and uh, optical dilatometers being able to analyze the thermal expansion, but also sintering processes and also melting and flowing processes in the optical microscope uh, in the high temperature range exceeding 2000 degrees C. With that, I'm concluding my presentation for today and hope that I can answer the questions you might have typed into the uh, chat. And thank you very much for your attention. Frida, thank you for a great presentation. And uh, before we start into the Q&A section, I would like to mention that uh, this uh, webinar will be available for download uh, in a few days uh, on the TA website, so you can uh, see it again if you like. And uh, we have um, received um, a huge number of uh, questions here. And um, so I would like to mention that um, in case we will not be able to answer your specific question right here, we will reach out to you by email. And with this, um, I am reading the first question. And it's actually a combination of two. It is, if I am looking at high temperature viscosity of molten salts, would I require a viscometer or rheometer? And also, how about fluids with nanoparticles? Are the rheometers able to measure properties of these? Frida? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so, as I, as I said in the presentation, when the, when the fluid behaves non-Newtonian, um, then uh, we can measure it, but at certain shear rates. So we can control at a given temperature the, the shear rate, which is actually the rotational speed in, in the viscometer, and determine the shear rate dependent uh, viscosity and properties. Um, 
I have to admit that I don't know uh, if there is a, a common, let's say, uh, a behavior for molten salts if they are all Newtonian or non-Newtonian. This is something I cannot answer here. Um, we are in discussion with some potential customers uh, about this, and we certainly will perform some test measurements and find it out uh, very soon. But in the moment, I cannot answer this question. Second part of the question regarding the the, the yeah, forming of, of crystallites in the melt. Uh, I think it could be could be seen already in the example of the mold powder. In the mold powder and also in the lava, we have this cooling down partly crystallization and crystals are formed. The measurement can be continued. However, if the crystals get too large and the size of the crystals approaches something like, I would say, uh, 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 um, maybe half or a third of the of the free uh, slit which we have for the for the liquid between the rotor and the crucible wall, then we certainly cannot continue the measurement or the values will not be really meaningful uh, with quality values. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Uh, the next qu uh, question is from Mike Novak. Is there a chance to measure under pressure higher than ambient? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I can answer this question in German. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, uh, uh, no, this is not possible. So we can control the atmosphere, but uh, um, since it's a high temperature instrument, all inner parts, the protection cube uh, in the furnace is made of a ceramics material. It can withstand uh, the vacuum, so one bar pressure difference, but we have no pressure controller. We cannot uh, measure at higher pressures than atmospheric pressure. Okay, good. Thank you. Then uh, next question is from Swapan Das. What is the difference in furnace heating elements of VIS-403 and VIS-413? Um, this is a different, uh, first of all, a different material and also a different, um, different uh, shape or design of the furnace uh, heating elements. So in the VIS-403, it was a silicon carbide heating element limited to maximum temperature of about 1500 and something degrees C. And here we have a different heating element um, with a different shape also. And these heating elements can be uh, um, heating up to temperatures of um, 1850 degrees C so that we reach the, the 1750 degrees C sample temperature. It's uh, so different material and also different design of, of the furnace. OK. The next quest question is, what happens to volatile components during the measurement of viscosity? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, we, we, as I said, we can purge the, the upper part uh, viscosity sensor, uh, and it's a similar principle like is uh, applied in a TGA. And with this purge from the top, we basically suppress the, the volatile or the, or the vapors coming from the sample to move up into the viscosity sensor. At the same time, we also purge the sample area at the bottom of the instrument yeah, with a reactive gas or with an inert purge gas. And the two flows basically come together in the, in the center, in the flange of the, uh, below the viscosity sensor and leaving there. So that means if something is evaporating from the sample and we purge the, the inner volume, then it will be transported um, via this outlet connection into the ventilation as a continuous gas flow transporting all the volatile components out of the instrument. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, what is the possible or achievable, achievable vacuum level? Mm, this depends, I have to say. So we connect to this. Um, it's not a high vacuum tight uh, design. It's vacuum, let's say, a working vacuum tight. Um, and we connect it to a rotary vane vacuum pump with an ultimate vacuum in the range of 10 to the minus 4 millibar. And um, since all the connections between the vacuum pump and, uh, and the viscosimeter are decently large, uh, it, the, the vacuum level which we achieve in the viscometer depends basically on the time of uh, pulling vacuum. Yeah. So if we just pull long enough the vacuum, we will be ending up in, in a range of 10 to the minus 3 uh, uh, millibar. And depending, of course, also on the sample material. If the sample material outgasses, then it takes even longer and uh, will also um, 
uh, how to say, break the vacuum. Yeah, if the sample material is not outgassing and we pump long enough, we can come down to the mi 10 to the minus three level. Okay, perfect. Uh, the next question by Dinesh Tiagi: Can the outgasses be collected for analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good good point. Uh, to be honest, we have not thought about this up to now. We have a dedicated flow path, like you have in a, in a TGA instrument, for instance. So we have a we have an inlet connection and we have an outlet connection, and it is in principle, of course, possible to use a gas sampling, um, uh, uh, take a gas sample from the outlet connection and then analyze, for instance, uh, in, a, in a mass spectrometer or an FTIR instrument, which gases are released from the sample during the heating process. However, we, we have to say that the internal volume of the viscometer uh, is relatively large, so that will be a very diluted peak of of uh, yeah, gas coming from the sample. It will not be very accurate compositional analysis, but it it can be connected. This is a, but this is nothing we have as a as a product actually in, in our portfolio. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, it's a very interesting idea, of course. Mm -hmm. The next question uh, we have is again from Mike Novak. Is there a magnetic coupling between bob and motor to allow measuring under vacuum? Obviously, there can't be any shaft sealing. Uh, no, there is no shaft sealing and there is no magnetic coupling. We have the, the complete uh, drive, the EC motor and the uh, um, encoder for measuring the rotational speed in the vacuum chamber. So this is the, the complete uh, sensor, uh, viscosity, uh, viscosity sensor, is installed in a vacuum tight environment and so the complete uh, internal volume including the sensor is evacuated. So no magnetic coupling. Okay. The next question is, is it possible to get flow curves that we get from uh, from rheometers? Um, flow curves might be a bit too much. Uh, this this instrument is a viscometer, so it can, can control um, different uh, shear rates, so we can control different uh, rotational speeds and, and measure um, the torque required at the, the at different rotational speeds. So in a way, this is a flow curve. We have uh, a controlled shear rate and uh, uh, a measured shear st stress. Yeah. Uh, but it's not it's not the ro uh, rheometer. A real rheometer is able to much finer control of the conditions of the shear rate as a viscometer is. We just control in steps of rotational speeds. Let's say we start at 300 go to 250, go to 200, and so on. Uh, we don't have a, a have a um, control in a, in a sinus, for instance, or in a, a continuous control of rotational speed. We go in steps. But the flow curve can be constructed from the data which we measure in the viscometer. Okay, good, thank you. Next question is, how do we make sure that the alumina crucible does not cause oxidative degradation when exposed to a polymer sample under test at a higher temperature while while shearing. Um, yeah, um, this cannot be uh, ensured. The, the only solution we have for samples which um, um, do uh, react with uh, uh, alumina, uh, we can uh, use a platinum crucible or we can use crucibles and rotors, of course, made from different materials. Candidate materials for these high temperature ranges is, uh, for instance, fused silica. Yeah, when we don't go above, above a thousand degrees C, we can use fused silica. If we go to higher temperatures, another candidate materials are uh, graphite, for instance, or other ceramics. But ceramics are typically oxides, so then the, the problem of uh, oxidative degradation might happen in all ceramics. In this case, probably a metal crucible would be the better choice. Okay, but do we offer uh, other, other crucibles than alumina and the platinum that we saw in the presentation? No, uh, um, alumina and platinum is the standard, uh, and we can uh, discuss about making non-standard crucibles depending on the sample material and the temperature range which should be covered. 
Okay. If for, if for uh, instance, temperature range is not so high, excuse me, uh, if temperature range is not so high, we can think about glass and we can also think about other metals than, uh, than platinum. Platinum is a really expensive uh, material. If temperatures are in, in the polymer, we don't go to, to 1500 degrees C typically, that means we could also use other materials, metals, which withstand uh, the, the four or 500 degrees C, which we might need. Okay. And I have another question uh, in the same direction, and this is um, basically how do I clean the crucible and the bobs? Um, they are certainly not disposable, are they? Um, yeah, um, the, the ceramics actually are intended to be disposed. Yeah? These are consumable parts, and um, um, you, uh, the, the idea is to use a new crucible at least every time when a new sample is introduced. Platinum and uh, other materials, which might be more expensive than the alumina crucibles, are, are to be cleaned. And then the cleaning depends on, on the material which was used before in the, in the viscometer. Typically, it consists of a heating process. So in an in a external furnace, the crucible is heated upside down so that the material is again melting and flowing out of the crucible. Yeah depending on the temperature and the viscosity of the fluid, uh, this is relatively clean then. And platinum, after this, if, if still a remaining f um, sample is in the platinum, can be treated by an acid treatment yeah, to, to remove uh, remaining uh, material, sample material from the, from the crucible. So it's part, part, depending on the material, it's disposable or it has to be cleaned by heating and proper uh, acid or uh, organic solvent cleaning. Okay, good. Then, uh, I will allow two more questions uh, and then we finish. Um, first question is um, from Sarah French. Does software adjust the rotational speeds on its own or is that a manual adjustment? I presume this refers to the to the procedure I described that after, you know, when, when the torque reaches the maximum level, uh, the, the rotational speed is reduced. Yes, oops, this is done automatically. So this, the software has this internal threshold, uh, 50 million newton meter, which we suggest to use. It can be adjusted, but we suggest to use this one. And if uh, the torque approaches this level, then the, the next lower rotational speed is applied automatically by the software. Okay, good. And then uh, the last question for today is by Marie Lohr Fontaine. Is it possible to measure a sample in various gas atmospheres? Yes, this is uh, various gas atmospheres. Uh, we can control reactive gas atmosphere and we can switch between an inert uh, purge gas and a an reactive uh, purge gas. So this is the, let's say, the variability we have uh, with the with the gas supply module which we supply. Yeah? So if this, uh, if a more complex uh, gas program should be used with more gas changes, then our gas supply module cannot handle this, but it's of course possible to supply to our gas supply module a changing gas composition. Yeah? By, a, by an extra external valve setting, for instance, you can switch between different gases uh, uh, manually or, or, or somehow by trigger controlled uh, with the software so that it would be possible to switch also the gases during a measurement. Okay, perfect. Then um, I would like to thank you again for answering all the questions and I would like to conclude uh, the Q&A session. And uh, again, I would like to mention that the remaining questions will be answered by email. And uh, for now then, I would like to thank all of you for joining us uh, for this webinar and uh, I hope that we can welcome you again soon for, um, for another TA webinar and uh, thank you again for now and say bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.